Welcome to our Think Big series brought to you by PSG. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carl Glow, and I'm a portfolio manager and strategist at PSG Wealth. PSG is a leading financial services group with an extensive national footprint in both South Africa and a presence in Namibia. We've been in operation since 1998 and pride ourselves providing bigger picture approach to our clients' financial needs from asset and wealth management, as well as short-term insurance. We offer clients access to a wide range of insurance and investment products based on comprehensive advice. Our clients benefit from propriety products and solutions, as well as a comprehensive third-party products. Now, the Think Big series is a collection of dialogue with leading speakers hosted by award-winning financial journalist, Bruce Whitfield. We aim to bring the audience independent insights that help them formulate their own opinions you know, on the country's you know, current most pressing issues. Uncertainty and challenges continues to abound, but armed with knowledge, I think we can tackle this head on. Now, in today's webinar, Bruce talks to Premier Alan Windy. Now, Premier Windy has previously served as Provincial Minister of Finance, Minister of Economic Opportunities, and Minister of Community Safety. He was first elected as an MPL in 1998, well, 1999, a position he you know, served for 10 years. Now, his campaign for premiership was centered on improving you know, economic and household prosperity by getting the basics right. Now, this includes education, healthcare, improving safety, and also public, you know, public transport. He's further committed to improving the efficiency of government services delivered through innovation and you know, new technology. Now, the topic for today's webinar is the future of Western Cape. Now, I might, might be biased as a boyki from Belleville, but many see the Western Cape as uh, one of the best run provinces in South Africa. But is this really the case? You know, what's been the successes and uh, what's been the failures? And more importantly, how's the province positioning itself in response to the pandemic? Now, this uh, Think Big series, is, uh, it's got a social media campaign, which called hashtag Think Big PSG. The series is free, it's shareable, and open to anyone interested, so whether you're a PSG client or even not. Now, I'd now like to hand over and give me a big, great privilege to hand over to Bruce Whitfield. Well, thanks very much indeed, Alan Windy. Welcome to the PSG podcast, to the Think Big series. Um, he talks a little bit about Skulk talks a bit about your political career in the last decade or so, um, but there's not much known about you before that. You're like this guy who comes out of nowhere. Um, my research tells me you're born in Nizda. Um, you start small businesses and then you get involved in local politics. Perhaps just take me through a, a quick timeline of Alan Windy before he becomes famous? So uh, I actually started a bit before that. I was actually not born in Nyza. I was born in Gauteng. But hi, Bruce. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. I was born in Gauteng and uh, lived on a small fruit farm out uh, near Mulder's Drift. My mother was the farmer and it was an organic peach farm. Uh, so that's what I grew up with, uh, living in a sort of uh, agricultural rural area. But uh, while I was still at school, my parents moved down to Neisner and I did finish schooling in Neisner and uh, yeah, I ended up uh, eventually going back to Neisner and being uh, involved as an entrepreneur in various businesses. Ten companies that I either started myself or got involved in. Uh, one of them I bought over and changed, the, uh, changed around, but really an entrepreneur and no specific uh, single direction. I mean, it was from... Uh, uh, resin molding to uh, boat covers on top to uh, you know uh, signage and screen printing, number plate manufacture to tourism to travel agencies. I mean, you know anything and everything. Is if there was a gap in the market, I would take it. I was a an opportunistic entrepreneur. I mean, and those are the, exactly the sort of people that the country needs more of, more of the time, and unfortunately, in very very short supply. What, what, what was your favorite business? I mean, what was the one that you thought to yourself, actually, I can make a career out of this before you got into politics? I think it was probably the, it wasn't actually the business. It was always the challenge of getting the business going. That's what, what drove me. When the business was up and running, it didn't matter which field it was in. It almost became a little bit boring because then it was the marketers and the accountants and the you know, I like the challenge of the idea and then getting the idea to work. That was, and so when the business was up and running, I'd sort of like then start veering off and start the next one. So I always had two or three at a time and uh, yeah, they, they would just come and go. And I was never really attached to any specific one. You know, it was, it was just part of who I was. I, and, and I think maybe 
Uh, maybe I got bored. And I mean, one thing I've never got bored of is uh, politics. It's, there's always a challenge every single day. And then you've got to try and work out what it is you're going to do about it. Talk to me about the challenge of politics, because it strikes me, and forgive me for this observation, and so soon into our relationship on this, on this call, but you've got a bit of a short attention span. You get bored easily. So you make the move out of small business and into politics. What was the, the motivator there? Because it was local politics, very, very local politics, on quite a small scale at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, maybe, the, maybe it is a short attention span, uh, although it was 10 years in business, 10 years in opposition, and now 10 years in government, and now I'm into the second year of a premiership. But uh, yeah, while I was running my businesses, this was in the early days of our, of our democracy. Um, we, we had in 94, we had our first democratic election. In 95, it was our local government election, so it was the municipalities. But in those days, our municipalities were quite small. Uh, nowadays, our municipality is sort of a wall-to-wall. We had these rural areas in between the municipalities. And I lived in uh, Belvedere. And we were in those days, Belvedere wasn't even in the Niza municipality. It was separate and outside. And uh, we, in 96, we had the rural elections. And, uh, you know, I asked two months before the election, you know, who are we voting for? And I wasn't prepared to vote for, there was only two parties standing. And I thought, no, well, I can't do that. Um, and then we had a look if any other political party would stand and they, they wouldn't. So in actual fact, I actually ended up being an independent candidate at the district council, which is quite interesting because suddenly independent candidates are quite uh, the flavor of the month at the moment or the flavor of the year. Uh, although I found out very quickly that I couldn't do too much as an independent. Uh, and I even carried the sway of power. I was the sort of, I was the kingmaker in that local municipality. But um, I then uh, also was approached uh, two years later to, to uh, join the Democratic Party then to come to the provincial parliament. And you know, after much deliberation, I said, all right, I'll do it. And uh, that's how I started in 99. As uh, yeah. my 10 years in opposition, I ended up at the provincial parliament. Um, talk to me about uh, the leadership of the party, because that would have been under Tony Leon, if I've got my timelines right. He was a very particular uh, kind of leader, old school Westminster style politician. Very soon after that, of course, um, he stepped aside, Helen Zilla became involved, and then later on, Helen Zilla is no longer involved, now she is involved again in the party. Um, just talk to me about the, the personal dynamics of the party and your experience of those personal dynamics, because there are some quite very strong personalities, I'll put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. So in those early days when, uh, when I was um, still in business and uh, looking for those rural areas, I actually approached the Democratic Party then to say, are you standing in this election? And if you remember in uh, 94, the then Democratic Party, you know, had a very small uh, turnout in the election. Um, and uh, Tony was sort of saying, well, let's consolidate the opposition vote. Remember, he was even asked to become part of the, the, the then um, you know, government. And he said, no, we need to have a strong opposition and started to build from there. But that's why I ended up as an independent, uh, because at that stage, the Democratic Party was building because they were, they were starting to regain from where they were. And then, of course, yeah, yeah as you say, I was, I was part of the, the DP and then became the DA in that process, um, which was quite interesting, uh, in that evolution of a party and starting to grow in sufficient uh, you know, I started off in opposition and we grew sufficiently to get a 50 plus 1 percent majority um, in 2009 when I, that, that was when we got into, into government and that was with Helen Silla as the premier. Uh, so obviously, as you say, I worked with, I worked with Tony, worked with Helen, uh, then, we, then it was Musi uh, and now we're in, we, we've got John. And uh, yeah, as you say, and Helen's back in at, uh, at, a, at a sort of administrative level in the party. Um, and yeah, different leaders, different styles, uh, myself also, you know, setting my own path. What am I going to be doing? What do I want to achieve out of this? I must say that uh, 10 years ago, when I first got in, I would never have thought that I would have ended up in this job. Uh, it wasn't something that I was sort of setting my sights on. Um, I, was, I was excited to be part of uh, a government that was going to be, you know, hopefully leading change in our country. And that, that for me, was the exciting part. 
I'll, I'll get to personalities in a, in a little while. That leading change, Skulk mentions it in the introduction. He says, from his perspective, you know, he's very happy to live in the Western Cape. He believes it to be the best run province in the country. And uh, yeah, you'd have to concur with that. Otherwise, um, it'd be a different conversation. Um, but what, what, what is the secret source of the Western Cape in terms, and we can do it objectively, purely on issues such as audits, for example. Um, the audit outcomes for the Western Cape are considerably better. The uh, unemployment rate, certainly the most recent statistics suggest unemployment is lower in Western Cape than it is in other provinces. There does seem to be something happening in the Western Cape that isn't happening in many other provinces. So I think the first thing that happened for us is we got 50 plus 1%. In actual fact, in, in, at that stage, we thought we were going to end up with a coalition government. Um, it was the first time at a provincial level that, uh, that an opposition party had a shot at taking over a province. And uh, we got that 50 plus 1%. Um, and we then said to ourselves, what are we going to do? What is it that we need to do differently? And, you know, our country was in the state where corruption was sort of uh, spoken about at every level. Um, and we then said, well, what we should be doing is focusing on governance. And for those 10 years, we focused on governance. We put a plan in place. And that, that the governance part is about getting the audits right, about making sure that, uh, you know, you, you're actually looking inwards. You're understanding risk and, you, and you're building this machine in the, in, in the in, inside system. When I became the premier two years ago, it was just short of two years ago, I said that uh, you know we've, we've worked on this and we've achieved what we wanted to do. Now we've got to make sure that governance is a habit and we've now got to start focusing on service delivery and the citizen. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to do now. We've got to keep it as a habit. You, you can't, but if you take your eye off the ball, you know that you know, you've got to, so it's sort of keeping, keeping that fire going, but now it's focusing on, on the, the sort of services side of our government. And that's going to be my focus uh, for this term specifically, although what I have done is I've also taken on some extra mandates. So safety, we're doing a lot more in safety, which from a provincial constitutional point of view is not really uh, what provinces do. We're putting boots on the ground. We, but I also believe, I mean, our constitution and our system of governance was, was set up 30 years ago, you know, when they started to draft our constitution in, in December, it was about, it was December 1990. That was when they started to set up what the framework was, what a, what a provincial government looked like. I think uh, we need to change some of those things now. So where provinces aren't working or haven't been working, you've basically declared mini UDI in terms of um, in terms of boots on the ground, in terms of safety and security. You've been pushed very successfully and have won the right for uh, for municipalities that are in good standing with the Auditor General to start procuring power independently because we can't rely on the national grid, for example. Um, and you've succeeded in getting the Department of Energy to concede to that and to allow you to do it. I mean, is this a sort of a drive for greater independence of the Western Cape? So I believe in a federal system. Uh, I also believe that the founding fathers of our constitution believed in that as well. You know, that power should be closer to the people at municipal level, provincial level, a national level must be far more federal overall governance body and step in when necessary. So, for example, in policing, I believe that the policing power should be devolved, devolved lower and that if you fail, it should come up, as you say, in, with, with provinces or municipalities in good standing. You must have the governance in place. You must have the systems in place and the ability but then you should be able to actually carry out that, uh, that power uh, and then nuance it to what you need for your specific region. Because in policing, I mean, policing in the Northern Cape and policing in the Western Cape will need two different dynamics. It's, uh, or how, maybe Gauteng in the Western Cape would be similar, but, uh, you know, Limpopo would be different again. And uh, St Statistically, okay, here, here, here's an example. Statistically, the Western Cape is the most dangerous province in the country. Statistically, Cape Town is the scariest city in, one of the scariest cities in the world. We've got right. horrific crime rates. Those yeah. crime rates, however, if you do the proper analysis, are centered very, are very sort of in, in silos, if you like, in particular policing districts. Half the country's murders happen in a, a fraction of the policing districts in the country. It's a, it's a drugs problem, and it's largely a problem that remains 
fairly confined to the Cape Flats. The national government then gets, we must solve this problem, get the army onto the streets, and you're then completely disempowered from that desire to be federally responsible for, for fighting those sorts of crimes. How do we successfully allow the Western Cape to deal with the Cape Flats drug and gang problem without intervention from government, but also have government in the background if it becomes necessary? I, you know, I hope I'm not confused, muddying the water too much here. Okay, so I mean, I, that's exactly what I did is I actually went to National and said, let's put a constitutional change in place. Let's get devolution of policing powers to provinces. And uh, just as we've done with trains, I mean, I believe that our trains should be run at uh, regional level. They shouldn't be run from, from Chwane. I mean, that's just not how it should happen. And uh, I mean, the one thing was the police minister said to me, not over my dead body. But then we started to say, well, what can we do in the meantime? And that's part of our safety plan. It's about how we get extra boots on the ground, how we get every department involved. We don't control the criminal justice system or the South African police services. We only have an oversight role of those uh, of the policing services, not even really an oversight role of the criminal justice system. Um, what I've designed is a cabinet system where we actually invite them in. Uh, we've started to work a lot more with them, but at the same time, we've found loopholes. So that's the boots. We, we're doing it through the municipalities where we're actually putting the boots on the ground. You're correct. We have 152 policing precincts in our province. Uh, 10 of the 152 police precincts of 50 or cover 50% of our murders. So they are very concentrated. Um, and so if we zoom into those 10 policing precincts with extra boots, but then it's about how do we deal with young boys who, who are sort of leaving school and getting involved in gangs? So we've got Project Chrysalis where we bring those young boys at risk out of the system. Let's put them into programs where we actually teach them skills, where we put them into a boot camp. Uh, we get, actually give them a stipend and a job in one of our governments for a year because you can't just put them straight back into society. They'll just flip straight back in again. It's about safer schools. It's about, it's about so many things that are uh, uh, the whole of government and the whole of society have got to play a role in uh, changing. So we've set ourselves a 10-year plan. I've set the target of halving the murder rate. And uh, yeah, these things are easy to say. Um, and you've got to make sure you've got a proper plan in place and you're slowly rolling them out. So uh, now uh, Minister Fritz in our cabinet is responsible for it. Uh, we've set up extra dog canine units. We've changed our traffic department. They're now a highway patrol. So we're giving them more powers so that they must actually stop the, the drugs on route on our road routes. Um, you've seen some big drug busts now off our, on our coastline um, with, uh, with some of our vessels in some of our smaller harbors. Um, we've now started a program. We just started the first rollout of safety ambassadors, a thousand of them uh, going into communities, becoming eyes and ears. Um, yeah, there's a, and I mean, we, I don't think we've even scratched the surface. In the so, so much of what government does generally around the world, it's not specific to South Africa, is deal with symptoms rather than causes. And what strikes me is you're trying to, yes, we've got to deal with the immediate symptom, which is the violence and the criminal criminality. But unless you've help fix the societies in which those things are going wrong, you've got no chance of sustainably altering people's destinies. Correct. And my, and my passion is about economic growth and small business development and entrepreneurship and getting jobs into our system. But in the 10 years that I was in government in, in Helen's cabinet dealing with the economics of our region, um, the, the one thing that keeps on coming up is safety. And so that's why in my campaign, it was about jobs, but it was actually also about safety. And if we can get those two right, um, we continue trying to grow the economy, but we create that environment that actually starts to deal with safety because safety is the big question that allows people to make decisions on whether they move here or not, whether they invest here or not. It is a big, big, it is a critical question around just how citizens live. I mean, and, uh, you know, they yeah, there are those parts that you just mentioned of specifically our city, but our province, where school children, uh, learners, do homework underneath the kitchen table because of stray bullets. Uh, yeah. That's not a that you can't you can't create a future economy like that. Uh, you can't create participants in your economy when when they're not able to actually you know get the opportunities that they need to be effective role players in the future if they are scared because it's just a dangerous place.
Talk to me about how you managed COVID, because I think it's quite informative as to the makeup of your thinking in terms of how government works or should work and how government can possibly work better into the future. Because by its very nature, government is silo based. Um, you've got one department that does a job of education, you've got another job that does safety and security, another job that does social services. But it's pretty obvious that all of these things have to be able to work together in order to be effective to and rather than just deal with symptoms, deal with the original problems. When it came to COVID-19, no, you hadn't been in office very long at all as Premier. And the next thing, COVID-19 strikes and the rule book has to be thrown out the window. Well, the old rule book has to be thrown out the window. So, so despite the trauma and the loss, it was a very exciting year because we suddenly had a focus. And I, and I think it's actually changed, I think, the way that government thinks and the way that we in our government think. But uh, I mean, the first thing I did was I said we had to be, we all had to be on board. So in the beginning, Sundays were set aside for strategy. We had cabinet meetings on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, and in those cabinet meetings were all the ministers, all of the heads of department. And then I included all of the mayors of the districts and all of the municipal managers of the districts. I included police. Uh, I included uh, the, the various departments from the city of Cape Town. And we met every, you know, every second day we were meeting. And uh, we set ourselves these targets. Uh, we went out there. We adjusted our budgets. We really zoomed in and focused. And for me, what really stands out is how we, in, we first of all, got that breakdown in silos because uh, I was appointing people in, from different departments to head up the same focus, in, in you know, compartments in the same focus. So suddenly you had the head of sport and culture was leading our, 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 our uh, food system and making sure that those who weren't getting a meal were going to get one. Um, so he was suddenly, and then he had to make sure it had social development in there, he had local government in there. So suddenly you, you were mixing people's portfolios, giving them a job to do. And uh, it was amazing for me to see the innovation that came out. So, I mean, if I had to sort of at the end of it say, what, what was it like in the last year? I would say it was a year of amazing innovation. Um, and to give you some examples, I think, uh, you know, we built, we built the biggest field hospital on the African continent in six weeks. Um, you know, the, the, I tell the planners now when they want to build sort of a new housing development or something, I said, so how long is this going to take? And they're telling me like seven years. Or I said, come on. So you did it in six weeks over here. I don't expect you to do a whole big you know, concrete mortar development in six weeks, but cheapest instead of three years, it's going to be one year. Um, so, so, I mean, that was amazing to me. But uh, then, then I think stuff that's going to be entrenched forever is our medicine delivery. So we, our health department started analyzing where the risks were. In our system, in the, in the, in the public health care space, the risks are uh, elderly citizens and citizens with comorbidities who queue outside our hospitals and our clinics for their meds. They queue from four o'clock in the morning and uh, they wait until lunchtime and they get their meds and then go home. Now, those are the exact people we have to protect in a COVID-19 environment and pandemic. So straight away, we did a partnership and this didn't come from management. This came from sort of middle management. Um, but a partnership was put together between the Gates Foundation, Uber, NGOs on the ground and our health department. And we, would, we knew how our clients were because they came to fetch their medicine at our clinic. All we did was we just centralized the data. We then packed the medicine parcels. They would be collected by Uber. The, the data system would be helped via, via uh, the Gates Foundation, helped us set up those, dates, those data systems. And then an NGO. Um, it could be the Red Cross. It could be St. John's. For example, in Langa, St. John's was the, the NGO on the ground. They would get the, the sort of wable almost and the packs of medicine and they would go door to door, do a screening for COVID-19 and hand over the medicine. We've now done 1.3 million parcels of medicine to our citizens who were highly at risk and they've got meds delivered at home. We can't step back. That's got to be the new way that meds are delivered in this province. To the poorest of the poor, you get meds delivered to your door. We can't change that. And I mean, from that to taxi systems, we... We, we used a partnership with taxis. We used to fight with taxis. You know, now suddenly we had a partnership with taxis. They would collect our healthcare workers on an app from home, t- 
take them to the healthcare facility and take them home again. Because we had curfew, we had lockdowns, and we had risk. You know, you didn't want a healthcare worker working in a COVID-19 ward than getting into public transport. So, I mean, that's changed the way that our relationship with the taxi industry. And so now I've got 1,300 taxis in a behavioral change partnership pilot in this province to see if we can put incentives in place to get to get uh, behavioral change with taxis that they're not chasing over pavements and driving badly and giving terrible customer service. They're giving a great service. And if they give that, they'll get an incentive. So this is another pilot that's come out of yeah. one of the innovations in COVID-19. Um, talk to me about trains. You mentioned trains. And of course, trains have been the lifeblood of commuters in Cape Town for generations. Um, the networks are good. The networks are deep. Um, and the networks have failed. Um, you go back to the point that you say, you know, Prasa shouldn't be running these things. The province should. But I think that's an ongoing battle. Yeah, I must say that it looks like we've just in the last two, three months taken a step forward. So there seems to be a more, more of a willingness from Prasa. Um, and it's not as if, you see, my other problem is that, you know, when it's only the DA run province that's pushing back or it becomes difficult. But Gauteng, yeah. got a good partnership with Gauteng and, and Gauteng need the same thing. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've, so from, from day one, I said, let's build those relationships with our fellow provinces, fellow premiers, DG to DG. Um, and that's really, we, we've worked on that relationship because there are areas we need to collaborate and there are areas we need to, we need to sort of uh, stand together when we want to, you know, get some kind of change. Uh, and we've learned that in COVID-19 as well, because we've had these regular PCC Sunday afternoon meetings of the premier, I mean, of the president. And, you know, you find a couple of premiers beforehand and you say, well, what's your line? Why? I'm thinking of this. And I promise you, we get things right that way. We, we, uh, we bring about change. And so trains are the same thing, um, although it is pretty frustrating. Uh, to, that's moving very slowly. And also during lockdown, I mean, the central line in Cape Town, we've got people now who have built shacks on the line. Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, I mean, that's a, 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 let's move on to that part of the conversation, which is the housing crisis. And one just looks all over Cape Town, for example, and one sees the, it was already a crisis of homelessness even before COVID-19. And the homeless people are increasingly visible. They have no choice. They're finding spots to uh, put up shelters. Uh, we're going into winter now. Um, and then you just look at the, the huge expansion of informal settlements. And there have literally been hundreds of incidents of land grabs happening around the city of Cape Town and around the Western Cape um, over the last 18 months or so. That incidence has increased. It's a, it's a real crisis of people flowing into an environment they perceive to be working better than anywhere else, looking for opportunity and not having the resources on the ground to accommodate people. Yeah. So that's also it's a very complex area. I think the first driver of the current situation is that we are still operating in South Africa under the disaster management regulations. And that has to end. Uh, we are busy with a strategy now, the second time now we are approaching national government again. We have got to find a different way of managing COVID-19 without using disaster regulations. Power must go back to the national cabinet, must go back to the provincial and, and city levels. Uh, it cannot be run by one department, uh, you know, and one minister. I mean, that just can't happen. And the part of the regulation is that uh, the, the eviction clauses are really put under strain. So, so people have been taking advantage of it. Um, I mean, it's, they're, they're pretty quick at doing that. And so we've had, uh, I think in the city alone, it's 1,100 pieces of land uh, that have been invaded. Um, and I mean, there's two sides to it. One is informal settlement growth. And the other is, uh, is also then just homelessness that's not even sort of moving into a, a, a shack on a piece of claimed land. This is people just sleeping on the street with a, yeah. with a cardboard covering or a tent. And you've also seen an explosion into that space. Uh, so we've got to think about it differently. We've got to, and uh, you know, I mean, San Francisco has got a, got a homelessness problem. So we've got to go and have a look at who does things best anywhere, anywhere around the world. And what can we do to kind of innovate over and above this? We, 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 we've, got to, we've got to tackle the problem, put some think tanks together and say, well, how do we deal with this? And I don't know what those answers are yet, uh, but we've, we've, we've busy, I've asked them, the, uh, our Minister of Social Development and the city of Cape Town. Let's get a think tank together. I've actually spoken to Andrew Borain from, 
from the EDP, the Economic Development Partnership, because it's also a key part of the econ economics of our region. Um, and you know, let's, let's think about this. I, I'll tell you a short snippet story if I've got some time. Sure. Is the other day I was going to a function and I got out of the car to walk into the function and there was a beggar on the side of the road. And he came up to me and says, listen, have you got any cash for me? I'm, I'm, so I said to him, my, my wallet is empty. I know it's empty because I've given my last money away um, to whoever asked for me earlier. And they very quickly said, snap scan. <laughs> and, and so I said to him, ah. So I said, all right, now I mean, I've just made an excuse. I've got no money in my wallet, but now he's coming with a snap scan. So as I'm taking out my phone, he says to me, and if you give me 120 Rand, you pay it directly to the shelter, I get a bed and I get a meal for a week. So suddenly my 10 or 20 bucks I was going to give him becomes 120 Rand because I'm quite happy that I'm giving it to the shelter and he's going to get a meal and a bed for a week. Now, this has been sort of a drive in my mind as to how else can we innovate around a way to actually create a space that uh, enables us to look after those who we actually, through the constitution, need to look after. They, they, they're not able to look after themselves at the moment. How do we create a space for them and a pathway? Because there's a percentage that are going to end up going back home again. There's a percentage if we link them through to some uh, EPWP program or a job program. And then, of course, there's always a percentage that the state has to look after in some way. And then there's also those ones that don't want to go into the shelter because you're not allowed to do alcohol and drugs in the shelter. But let's get to understand this in a better way that we can deal with it uh, humanely, but also effectively, because at the end of the day, it's also having an impact on investment. It's having an impact on confidence and it's having a definite impact on just, just the sort of the citizen psyche. Talk to me about the risk of success. Um, and I mean, who would think that success was a risky venture? But let's say the Western Cape is believed to be more successful than in other provinces. It draws wealthier people. They come in and they buy property and they may relocate their businesses or they may, um, they may do a commute. It also um, attracts people who are desperate for a new beginning or people who come from all over the African continent um, who end up at the Western Cape and contribute to the spread of informal settlements, who contribute to an environment which may therefore become less attractive to investors in the long term as well. It's this weird cycle um, that, that is playing out at the moment. So, so first of all, I generally, um, anybody who wants to come here, uh, I'm really happy that they come because these are risk takers. They're people who are prepared to pack up wherever they are and move here. Um, we, we see it in other economies. We see it with South Africans and Nigerians and New Zealanders and whoever else go and run the economy in London. Um, we see the same thing here. Risk takers coming into our economy. Um, I, I, I like risk takers coming in, but as you said, there's two kinds. Uh, there's one that's moving from somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the country. They're moving here. They, you know, they're investing in a home and a business or they're commuting or whatever they're doing. Um, they, 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 they're contributing immediately to the economy. There are others that come here to look for various. They look for education, they look for healthcare, and they look for jobs. They look for, for economic uh, opportunities. And as, a, as an indicator, um, I think the first one is the, the education side. Um, at the beginning of this year, unplaced learners in our system, 19,000. I mean, that's, that's, you know, a, a big school is a thousand learners. So that means we should have built 19 new schools just for what we got this year. It's, it's complex. It is, it is something that also we really are applying our mind to. And I've got a really great story here to tell you about it. But that's the one thing is in the education. And I mean, we're sitting now, I think uh, we're sitting at 1,700 right now. We, you know, we're already into our academic year. I've still got 1,700 learners still not placed. Uh, we need to place them before the end of this term so they can start their next term all in position. But, I mean, that's a huge ask uh, when our schools are full and uh, we've got to now find, uh, you know, another, another serious number of spaces uh, for people coming in. Um, and, you know, I think the same applies for jobs, the same applies for people coming to look for a place to stay. And, of course, then it also drives informal settlement, etc. cetera. Um, but then, of course, we've also got huge expansion on the other side. Um, you have, uh, you know, housing developments that are growing very, very fast, uh, new cities that are growing up. I mean, 
If you think about the size and volume that Century City has become since it started a few years ago, um, I mean, people talk about building smart cities. Yeah, you've got a smart city that's been built already. Um, operational, it's attracting you know, investment from all around the world. Um, then I look at the, the innovation and tech space. I mean, I said that when the, when the beggar on the street says SnapScan, you know that we're number five in the world when it comes to fintech. The number of fintech companies that are developing out of this region just blow my mind. And they, they're amazing. I mean, the, I, I always think of uh, Katlejo Mapai and, and Yoko. And I mean, I'm telling you, on the African continent, he's going to become a big player into the future of fintech on, on our on our uh, uh, continent, I've got no doubt about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of people coming, a lot of people coming uh, with opportunity and and growing opportunity, and like other, a lot of people looking for opportunity. And now, we, I mean, that's what we've got to do. We've got to continue finding the balance between the two and letting one enable uh, a correction of the other. I mean, it, it's a it's an exciting dynamic, but for many people, it's an unsettling dynamic, and it's a it's a, a dynamic that you know, drives immigration. It's a, it sends capital away, it sends skills away. How do you give people a reason to stay? How do you convince people that actually this is all under control? Yes, it's messy. Yes, it's noisy. Yes, it's deeply challenging. Um, but you you you've got a a wealth. The country's got a wealth immigration problem. Um, and I think the Western Cape has got it too. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, you know, every single day I have somebody saying to me, I'm packing up and I'm getting out here. I cannot see the future. Um, but then, you know, the next person I meet is a foreigner who's just moved here and built a home and starting his business. And he's going like, whoa, uh, you don't believe what, I can't believe what you got here. This is just amazing. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it is going to be the constant you know, conflict in the constant battle. I think that we've got, you know, we've got a great recipe here in our region, whether it's in one of our small coastal towns or even, I mean, you have a look at some of our Karoo towns and how they're attracting people from uh, around the world and locally. Um, and then, of course, Cape Town, the city of Cape Town. But cheapest, what an amazing place to stay. I mean, you know, we've got issues. But there are issues in every city in the world. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we've just got to continually make sh making sure that... Uh, we are putting the right things in place to make the biggest impact we can. I mean, and I think what's happening right now globally, sort of, I want to say post COVID-19, uh, we are just about post COVID-19, um, but uh, you know, it's a, it's a competitive dynamic world. And I mean, things that have come out of this region in the economic space, I think is what I've spoken about FinTech and, and the tech opportunities uh, of this region. We are recognized globally uh, between Cape Town and Stellenbosch as a tech hub. Uh, 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 it, it is already recognized. People are coming to work here in the tech field and the tech space. We're seeing investment. I mean, there's, there's a, a process. It's almost finished now with a 4 billion rand investment uh, from Amazon into our region. Um, you know, we, we, we are seeing uh, really, you know, serious plays in the market looking at at uh, this region and you know that's got to be the the counterbalance um and so people obviously they must make up their minds but it's not a boring place to live it's an exciting place. <laughs> and it's about certainly let, let's talk about the excitement let's talk about some other excitement so the excitement within your own party because we are going to local government elections coming in uh, october 24th um and uh, the power dynamics in south africa are interesting ANC is still very much dominant as a political brand the eff very loud as a political brand. The DA, certainly from the outside, looks like a party that isn't all on the same page in terms of pulling together uh, to cause electoral upset. Um, came very close in the last municipal elections as in the dying days of the Zoom administration. Um, coalitions in Joburg, in Swane, um, and in now Tobeja, um, and they had kept control of the city of Cape Town. Those coalition governments have been disastrous from a vulnerability point of view. Um, you know, how does this? How do you see October elections playing out? Yeah, I think. I mean, I want to start with coalition governments, and uh, I mean, I hear what uh, many of my colleagues in my party say about coalition governments, and that it is the future uh, of our country. It scares me no end. Um, one of the reasons why we managed to do what we've managed to do in the province is because we got 50 plus 1% of the vote. 
when you're in a coalition, it is not easy to manage. And I think that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the DA grew very fast into that local government uh, space. And those coalitions, you know, I think uh, they've also had their toll. They've, 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 uh, they've taken their toll on our system. I mean, you know, going into coalition government in, in uh, Johannesburg and in Chwane with the EFF, um, you know, I mean, yeah, we could have said we told you so, but not an easy coalition. Uh, coalitions in general in our country are not easy. Um, if I think about the coalitions in our province, uh, if you go and measure performance in municipalities, uh, you can see which ones are the coalitions because they are difficult to manage. They have instability and they default to the lowest common denominator because they're small uh, councils. They all, they all kind of stand or fall on one seat. And that one seat is normally the the kingmaker, one small independent party or small party, they become the mayor. They've got nobody backing them up. Um, and quite frankly, it seems to topple and change. And then if any party does come in and starts flexing their muscle to clean things up, well, then the coalition changes again because there's too much risk of opening up perhaps some, some old files that should have been closed. And uh, yeah, coalition politics is going to be a very, very bumpy ride. And we've seen it now. You just take the last five years and the, and the sustainability of municipalities. I mean, I was reading an article this morning that uh, you know, is showing in municipal levels that, I mean, we are really declining tremendously across our country in, in the ability to deliver services. And, it is and you would hope that electorates understand that they can choose and they can make choices. But we've seen Astral Foods, for example, take the Standerton municipality to court, finally win, force government to intervene within Standerton. But even where, you know, um, you know we're with Makanda, for example, and the failed water provision, just so many absolute failures on fairly simple points where government, local government has proven itself in many cases to be wholly inept. Do you think the South African electorate is at a point now where it's prepared to say, hold on a second, it's broken, it has to be fixed, and we need to facilitate that fixing ourselves, or do we still vote along narrow party lines? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I think this is going to be a very, very interesting local government election because there are these, you know, the, the, the formation of new political parties. Of course, I think we have more political parties than most places uh, on our, on our uh, ballots. Um, and then, of course, uh, independents are going to play a role in, in this election now for the first time as well, which is also going to be a very interesting dynamic. Um, but of course, independence also mean coalition governments. And uh, I, I look at that and I get quite worried. I, I, I say to myself, you know, imagine a, a big municipality, uh, any of our metro municipalities run by a coalition of independence. Um, you know, are you going to get the vision right? Are you going to get the big bulk stuff right? Or are you all going to be focusing on your ward and your pothole? And, uh, and then are you going to maintain a coalition government? You, you know, I mean, it's not easy. It's not easy in, in uh, should I say, first world governments. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult, I think, in our region. And I think the data shows it. So, yeah, I think we, we've got a bumpy ride ahead. Does the DA have a race problem? I, I don't, I say no. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've got an amazing team and we really are uh, trying to look beyond this. Although, of course, I mean, we still have a redress issue in our country, um, but we can't continue along the, the bean counting uh, route of the ANC because it hasn't, it hasn't given us the outcomes that we want. And uh, within the DA, you know, obviously we've got to, we've got to be that and live that uh, future that you want to see. I mean, and I just have a look at our team. I have a look at our team in, in government, our DA team in our province, in our caucus, in our Breda caucus, and in our cabinet. I say no. Uh, and I have a look at our management team. I say no. Um, but if you want to do bean counting, well, then maybe you can start to say, well, we need more women. or we need. But, you know, I, I think that uh, the, we can't spend too much time as a country bean counting when our... Uh, our South African Arab Spring is coming at us very, very fast. Uh, talk to me about that. Uh, anyway, 
pause that for thought because then that's you've made a provocative statement which you want me to pick up on because you don't want me to say Bongi and Kosi Matikizela. Let's do Bongi and Kosi Matikizela. Let's do Musi My Money. Let's do Helen Zilla. And then I want to come and maybe finish off on uh, that that risk of South African Arab Spring. Bongi and Kosi Matikizela. He's an ME, he's a, he's a member of your cabinet. Um, he is exposed for lying about his credentials and you immediately suspend him. How hard a decision was that? It was a tough decision. I mean, here is a man that uh, I'm a friend with. Uh, he's a colleague of 12 years or 11 and a half years in a cabinet with. Um, he's a great minister. He, he's a politician that says it how it is. So, of course, it's a very tough decision. Um, but it's also you've got to make the right decision. I mean, you know, when you put your hand up to take a a position like this, you know, you've got to, it's, it's, as they say, it gets lonely and it gets tough and you've got to make those tough choices. And so I immediately suspended him. Um, and I have got to finish this process by Thursday. Yeah. I mean, it's a really tough call to have to make on a guy who is good at his job, who is good to have around, who is capable, who is on side, but has made an error of judgment. And that error of judgment was to lie about a qualification. Um, it's, uh, you know, and it's happened many, many times before, um, and we've seen a greater rejection by uh, the public of people who lie. So he has to go. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a process that's, uh, yeah, it's not, a, not an easy thing to do. Anyway, that's, that's, what, yeah. uh, that's what this job entails. Talk to me about Musi Maimane and the DA's decision to um, kick him out. Um, he saw a decline in his majority. Um, he saw a decline in his in the in the DA majority in the last national elections. Tony Leon, in his most recent book, is unequivocal. Um, when Zach De Beer saw a decline in his in his uh, percentages twenty years ago, the party said, "You have to go." It's a it's a tradition of of politics around the world. But was it the right decision, in your view, to cut Musi my money loose? So, I mean, in actual fact, at that federal council, they didn't say you had to go. Um, I mean, he elected to go, but I, I think, again, you know, what is the right thing to do? Um, I'm pretty certain that if I was that leader, I probably would have stood down too. Uh, and bringing Helen Zilla back, I mean, I, I joked with you earlier and I said to you, are you scared of Helen Zilla? Maybe it's a good question. Are you scared of Helen Zilla? Lots of people are. No, I don't think so. I've worked with Helen for many years. Uh, you know, I worked for Helen... Uh, you know, when we spoke about that, uh, that first election where I moved from Neisner into being in the legislature, that was in uh, 1999. And in actual fact, uh, Helen was one above me on the list to Parliament. So, yeah, that was when we first got to know each other. We've worked together since that day. Um, yeah, I think we've worked well together. I mean, it was great serving in her cabinet. Um, but, of course, this is now... I'm now holding this job, um, and uh, yeah, she, but, and she holds a very different position now in the party and an administrative position in the party. Um, but I engage with her all the time. Uh, you know, she's she's sort of in the political leadership now, so I've got to almost feed back to them and report to them in certain ways. Is she good for the DA? She, you know, obviously after Musi stood down, um, you need to consolidate. Uh, and, you know, Helen's got very strong uh, management uh, uh, processes and principles in the way that she thinks. And uh, I think that's exactly what the DA needs. It needs to pull that together. It needs to, what she did with getting our government, you know, to focus on governance and become what it became, that's what she's got to do with inside the, inside the DA. Um, and is she doing the job? Because from the outside, one wonders whether or not the DA can perform as well as it did at the last local government elections. I mean, there, there were different dynamics at play. Of course, much of the support for the DA was an anti-Zuma vote and much of, and many of the people who stayed away uh, from the polls then was a, a protest against the Zuma administration. The dynamics, five years later, the dynamics have changed quite substantially. How do you see it playing out? They are very different. Of course, it is a big challenge for us, um, you know, and we've, we've having to build, you know, from the last election. Obviously, the, the real test, you can say whatever you like now, the real test is when that last vote is counted and what those outcomes are. I mean, our challenge in the province is to retain those governments that we run. 
and uh, try and uh, grow into some more that we don't run. Um, and as I said, in, in a lot of our smaller municipalities, it is, it is difficult because it all hinges on one seat or two seats um, between our parties as to who runs those municipalities. Um, but, you know, I mean, we've, that's what we've got to do. We've got to show our track record and say, okay, based on that track record, who's going to be the best at running your local government? I think it's, it's a no-brainer. Fairly recently, your adopted hometown of Neisner saw um, the DA getting a blood nose, uh, and quite a significant one as well in in in, uh, in recent local elections that took place there. I mean, one wonders whether or not the DA has got a perception problem in many of the uh, in many of the towns in which it operates. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it, it, and also for different reasons. So they're all you know they're different dynamics. But what happens when politicians fight? is you, you end up with administrations putting their head down. And I mean, there's no excuse. The DA had a few years of internal dynamics in the NISA municipality. Um, and then, of course, you add another layer to it in the coalition politics. And uh, so what happens is we lost power. Uh, and in that last by-election, um, we actually lost that seat, that, by, that, that, uh, that seat. And what had happened is the, the DA candidate um, decided to side with the coalition. And of course, then we had to remove, remove the candidates. And then of course, uh, the coalition all stood together. You saw even smaller political parties not standing in that election, everyone getting behind that candidate and getting that candidate reelected to keep uh, some of the coalition in power. Uh, so that's slightly different dynamic in a, in a smaller town. But it's also, you know, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to analyze it. You've got to say why. And, you know, as I, as I said, with safety, let's get to the cause. Uh, don't fix the symptom. Get to the cause. Let's dig in there and actually say, guys, we've got, to, we've got to change the way we behave in our government. You were very provocative a moment ago, talking about South Africa's Arab Spring is thundering towards us. Or I, I misquote you, but it, it, it's essentially what you were saying. Talk to me about that. Well, if you've got the highest un youth unemployment rate in the world, you've got really high unemployment rates. So people haven't really got hope of finding a job. We've still got massive corruption uh, levels. Um, we've got service delivery that's declining. Um, so people lose hope. And then when people lose hope, they get angry. Uh, and I think then, then on top of it, if people are hungry, um, and I think that's been a knock-on effect from COVID-19, losing your job, not able to, to feed your family. Um, that, that losing, losing <clears throat> I think uh, the, the mental impact is also pretty tough. Uh, uh, just as an anecdote, I was, I was chatting to uh, someone in the hospitality industry the other day, and uh, you know, they're sitting on 20% of their salary. It's been like that for a year now, and they can't see uh, you know, October. It doesn't, doesn't yeah. see... And they, they say, I'll do anything. I'll work for free. Just give me the dignity of waking up in the morning and doing something. You know, I think you add all of those together, it starts to have a really poisonous effect on our system. And we need to understand that risk. Uh, because if we don't understand that risk, I promise you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burst. And we, that's why we've got we've to choose those things. We've got to focus on them and change them. And so do the guys who want the Cape exit have a point then? I mean, can the Western Cape cushion itself from the rest of the country? Is it even feasible? Okay, so first of all, I say no. Um, it, it's not a workable solution. So first of all, internally, is it going to work? Is the ANC and the National Assembly right now going to agree to no. a constitutional change? No. So then let's say, let's go to an international court or, or an international uh, uh, area where it's going to lobby or push for independence of a province in a country. The first thing they're going to say is why? What is the reason that you don't want to be part of this new constitutional democracy, this new rainbow nation? And they're going to say, but it's because the ANC policies are failing, the ANC government is corrupt, the ANC, it's going to be, they're going to say, but these are political things. You can fix those things through the ballot. And of course, you have. You've given another political party the opportunity to really show how democracy works in our country. And actually, you're already ahead of the curve here. But what really gets me, so, so they're not, no outsider is going to say, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to push for 
for, for getting you independence. So the question is, so then what happens is, so now we've got to actually do then is, is reduce the DA's vote uh, in the province because they're not actually the ones that are going to fight for this thing that I really don't see succeeding. And so why don't we actually take them out of power? That really doesn't make any sense to me at all. If we had to take that same energy and say, guys, let's understand that this is a democratic country. We can actually change things through the ballot. We've proven it. It can change. So let's get together and change things through the ballot. That's what democracies do. And that would be my message to them. Do we have time? Um, you know, we, we talk about all the, the trials and tribulations, the failures of the state. Dennis Davis was on this uh, series a couple of weeks ago, and he was just talking about the inability of government to put it to do its job. Um, and you, you get a sense, you understand why people are feeling a little bit hopeless about the future. Even wealthy people, people with huge opportunity, people with, you know, you can go anywhere in the world with their skills are beginning to lose hope uh, in an environment where people who have nothing are also significantly at risk of losing hope. Is it fixable? So we've done it in the Western Cape and a number of municipalities here. Uh, already one of our great performing municipalities is in Gauteng in Midval. I mean, they really are. They're doing well. Uh, we, we're not far off in Johannesburg and Chuan. Um, we're back in power in this coalition in, in uh, Kobecha. I mean, you know, is it, is it too far? It can happen. It it's definitely can happen. And it, and it comes down to the boring stuff. I mean, it comes down to governance. It comes down to systems and processes. It comes down to running the place like an enterprise. It's the biggest enterprise in the country is government. And it's been yeah, mismanaged for so long. Um, you know, it's got to be brought back, I guess. And it's not as if we don't have the skills to do it. I mean, that drives me crazy as well, is when you've got to import Cubans. And, and, <laughs> but we've, we've, got, we've got amazing universities. We've got amazing entrepreneurs. We've, we've got a mindset here in the southern tip of Africa that, that achieves things, that does things, that's able to do things, that's able to think differently. We've got to create an enabling environment that actually allows that to, to, to bubble up to the surface. That's what we've got to do. Mayor Alan Wendy, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the Think Big series. Lots of thinking and lots of big thinking too. Uh, Skulk, oh, oh, yes, uh, last point to the I, I want to make a last point, seeing as that it's PSG in the room. Um, and I want to tell you a story about our education problem and something that blew my mind the other day. Okay. So uh, I don't know if you know, but Kuro School has opened a school in Delft. One of our poorer communities in the city of Cape Town. They've opened a private school in Delft. How it happened was ShopRite Checkers was developing a new shopping center and they gave a piece of land to Kuro. What, what amazed me is you've now got a private school in Delft where parents are paying 800 rand a month for private school education and it's working and people are paying and you're getting a great education and I thought to myself, wow, this is amazing. And I started engaging with Kuro. And if you look at parents in poor areas, they spend so much money every month putting their children onto taxis to send them to places that they are hoping to get a good education so that their children are going to get a better opportunity than them. That's what we all try and do. That's what happens when you become a parent. And in actual fact, the 800 rand a month is less than they're paying on the taxi. And quite frankly, that says to me, there's a new opportunity in how we're going to deliver education into the future. How are we going to build new partnerships between private sector, between government, the education space, um, linking it to new technology? And we can actually leapfrog now in education just because we've got private sector and government working together, or in this case, it was private sector and private sector working together, and now talking to government saying, how can we take this to the next step? And that the, disru me, the disruption in education is significant. I mean, the Kuro is not alone in this. There are other players also doing it at less than it costs government to put a kid through school. Um, Chris Van the founder, the founder of Kuro, offered government and said, let us build and manage your schools for you. You give us the budget, we will build it, we will manage them, and your outcomes will improve. We've will, you, will, you, will you talk? 
We've got, yeah, we are talking already. We've got 16 schools, not with Cura, but 16 schools with, uh, with they're called collaboration schools, where we've got uh, private sector management systems in those schools. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, w instead of a piece of land being given, we can give you a whole school building. Everything's there. Now, uh, and maybe what we do is we say, well, let's look at how much, what, what do you want from us? Can we subsidize? Uh, uh, let's go Harvey's in the costs. Or, but, but, the, but the trick is how do we get uh, the parent to have some skin in the game? How do we have some skin in the game? And let's have some excellence built on the other side. So I think there are some huge opportunities going forward in the innovation space and in, and in how we enable and allow innovation to take place as, as partnerships. And that's why we say in the Western Cape government, it's about better together because that is about partnerships. And together, you know, we've got to do this together. We can't do this alone. And, and we can actually make some massive changes. Alan Wendy, thank you very much indeed. Skulk, before he jumps in again, to you. Thank you, Bruce. Well, I must admit that that, uh, that left me extremely excited and, uh, well, extremely extremely scared as well. I mean, what a year it's been. Uh, you know, we still find ourselves in the midst of a, of, a, of a pandemic, you know, things like first waves, second waves, and even possible third waves. You know, Bruce, you mentioned the, the crime statistics in, in South Africa. And, and Premier Wendy, I mean, uh, you were talking about 19,000 new learners starting, you know, the 2021 year, you know, in the Western Cape. And that's, you know, that's 19 new schools. That is unbelievable. You know, add to that, that environment, a, a, let's call it an economic downturn globally, you know, things like junk status, down, down, you know, recessions. Um, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, you know, how can I describe you? And, uh, and I, I was thinking of Peter Drackel's, you know, saying where he said, whenever you, you, you see a successful business, someone might once made courageous decisions. Now, you remember, you know, back in the late 90s, begin 2000, you know, famous, you know, Springbok captain, Korna Kriche, they referred to him as, as Captain Courageous. So I, I want to, you know, baptize you today as, as Captain Courageous because the decisions you've made over the, over the past, you know, two years has been courageous. It's been quick. And I think that is due to you know, why we've been, you know, so successful. You know, uh, talking about a the biggest field field hospital um, that was 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 ejected, you know, in, in a matter of six weeks, the biggest field hospital in Africa. That that is that is big decision making, quick decision making, and um, innovative uh, decision making. But um, Bruce, as you, you know, correctly mentioned, we still find ourselves, you know, in deeply challenging environment. Now, a skilled and trusted advisor can be invaluable during you know, these uncertain times. They can provide objective insights and help you consider in you know, alternative scenarios to make you consider rational decisions on your wealth and also insurance portfolios. If you have an advisor, please, I want to encourage you to contact them today. And if you don't, please feel free to contact us. We are available www.psg.co.za. We welcome your feedback and uh, please communicate with us and um, be sure to register for our next exciting speaker in the Think Big series. Thank you.